Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for this week's uh, video lecture. Today we're looking at Strayer's Chapter 7, Commerce and Culture. And in the opening section, Strayer begins by raising the question of globalization, how interconnected um, we are in our current society, and sort of uh, getting us to think about where exactly that comes from. And uh, one of the main ways that developed over time is through trade routes. And uh, when we talk about trade routes, the Mac Daddy of all trade routes is the Silk Roads. Evidence suggests that parts of these routes were existing uh, during the Foundations era, but they would reach a new level during the Classical era when powerful empires served as producers, consumers, and protectors. The Silk Roads developed over time as a kind of relay system. It's important to remember that no one group of travelers made the entire journey. Instead, they would travel back and forth across a particular section, trading as they went. The Eurasian landmass, home to the majority of the world's population in many of its most economically productive areas, is divided by geography and historical development. In India, China, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean, there were a series of economically vibrant urban centers, states, and empires. These civilizations were on the periphery of the continent, or called Outer Asia. Between them lay the colder plains and steppes of Inner Asia. These lands were home to nomadic pastoral groups with herd animals. These nomadic pastoralists of Inner Asia raised animals and traded animal products with the people of the Outer Zone. They also began to carry products from one area to another, thus serving as the transportation for the goods across Eurasia. These pastoralists served at, as an indirect method of communication between the empires of the outer zone. For example, during the classical era, a Roman never met a Han Chinese directly, but they each learned of the other through the indirect connections created by the nomadic travelers. Over time, a system developed in which travelers on the Silk Roads would journey a day's distance and then stop to rest and stay overnight at a caravanserai, a kind of traveler's inn. These inns dotted the routes of the Silk Roads as well as across the Sahara Desert by the post-classical era. Caravanserai is a term Strayer really doesn't use a whole lot, but it's a term that you'll need to know. Um, that's what the asterisk indicates there. The most important good traded on the Silk Roads, obviously, silk. This fact has several social and political consequences. Staples and other foodstuffs were too heavy to carry on the Silk Roads. Because of the cost of long-distance transportation, the trade network thus carried lightweight and expensive items, especially silk, spices, and uh, porcelain from east, and wine, gold, and other goods from the west. For centuries, Chinese silk was produced by the Chinese female peasants and consumed by elite Chinese women. Increasingly, elite men such as government officials and religious figures in China and elsewhere began to demand silk. Europeans used silk for clothes and wall hangings. China enjoyed a monopoly on its silk production for centuries, but by the 6th century of the Common Era, the knowledge of how to make silk spread to the Byzantine Empire and various sites in Asia. As supply increased, the various types of silk and various uses for it also increased. In this map, you can see in red the main routes of the Silk Roads, um, but the sort of purplish circle there is what we would typically call Central Asia. That denotes uh, Inner Asia, the area that's mostly uh, sort of dominated by pastoral nomads. And then if you look, Outer Asia is the area that we typically think of as civilization from the Mediterranean, Persia, India, and China all sort of being outside of that um, zone, hence the term Outer Asia. Of course, more than goods were transported along the Silk Roads. Religions in general, but Buddhism in particular, also spread. As Buddhism spread, it gained converts among pastoral peoples and in oases towns. Many monasteries were established that became centers of wisdom and learning, as well as serving economic functions. Buddhists, uh, Buddhism's universal message had a strong appeal to the cosmopolitan merchant of uh, Inner Asia. 
As Buddhism left India, the doctrine changed. The Mahayana branch became the most predominant. Mahayana Buddhism saw the Buddha as a godlike figure, encouraged the veneration of bodhisattvas, and stressed various rituals. Wealthy monasteries began to get involved in political and economic affairs along the Silk Roads. In Bactria, Greek culture influenced Buddhist art and culture. However, not everything that spread had a positive influence. Pathogens, or disease-causing microbes, also spread. In the classical era, smallpox and measles caused various epidemic outbreaks on either end of Eurasia. In both cases, these epidemics caused population declines and, con and contributed to the fall of the empires. Between 534 and 750 of the Common Era, bubonic plague broke out at various times in various places around the Mediterranean. Sometimes these outbreaks could kill thousands in a day, as in a 40-day epidemic in Constantinople in 534. The most famous case of epidemic disease, though, was the Black Death. Spread during the Mongol control of the Silk Roads, it moved from China to Europe and the Middle East. It killed one-third of the European population between 1346 and 1350. As crucial as the trade was on the Silk Roads, a strong case can be made that the Indian Ocean trade was at least equally, if not more, important to the eco economics of the Eastern Hemisphere. Evidence suggests that some trade in the Indian Ocean occurred during the Foundations era. The Indus Valley Civilization, for example, had trade contact with Mesopotamia, and Egypt traded up and down the Red Sea. The regular wind patterns of the monsoons in the Indian Ocean allowed for fairly easy and consistent travel in the Classical Era. These patterns allowed the Romans to trade indirectly for black pepper from Southeast Asia, for example. Toward the end of the era, Malay sailors began to make long-distance travels across the oceans, bringing various crops such as bananas and coconuts as far as East Africa. The development of new technologies for ship shipbuilding and navigation allowed sailors from various locations around the Indian Ocean to engage in seagoing trade. These technologies included ships known as dhows, which used lateen sails to allow ships to tack against the wind, ships from China called junks, which used stern rudders for better precision, and tools such as the astrolabe and the compass that allowed for better navigation. Thanks to both its central geographical location and its vibrant economy, India naturally became the fulcrum of trade in the Indian Ocean Basin. Access to wealth associated with the Indian Ocean trade helps explain why southern India was never really incorporated into the various empires that were based in northern India. The economic revival during the Tang and Song periods in China gave a huge economic boost to the Indian Ocean trade. China produced a variety of goods for export to the rest of the world, increasing the volume of trade on these sea routes. China also served as a market for a variety of Indian and Southeast Asian goods. The rise of Islam had a positive impact on trade for several reasons. First of all, as the Prophet Muhammad had been a merchant, he served as a positive role model for, model for other merchants, in contrast to China, where merchants were deemed to be of dubious moral quality. Second, as the realm of Islam expanded rapidly, it created a single political system, the Dar al-Islam concept, that incorporated a number of different economic centers. In the Indian Ocean, Islam created an international maritime culture. In this map, the red lines indicate main trade routes uh, along the, um, mostly along the coast of the Indian Ocean, you can see over time the direct routes start to spread. That uh, big, thick uh, purple line is, is the route the Malay people took getting to Madagascar, which they eventually um, inhabited. To this day, uh, the people of Madagascar look more like uh, Southeast Asians than Africans. Um, and then, of course, remember the monsoon winds, even though the technology spreads that allows them to tack against the wind, the monsoon winds, because it's just so easy, continue to be a factor in the Indian Ocean. Even as India prospered as the fulcrum of the Indian Ocean trade, it's also the case that this trade helped to stimulate 
changes on both the eastern and western ends of the Indian Ocean Basin. In Southeast Asia, this led to the rise of several new states. The first of these was a uh, Buddhist kingdom um, based in Sumatra. It owed its power to the control over the flow of trade through the Straits of Malacca. With the taxes it collected from ships passing through this crucial choke point in trade between the Indian Ocean and East Asia, Srivijaya became a fabulously wealthy and cosmopolitan place. The second was a Hindu state centered in what is now Cambodia. The Khmer had a strong agricultural base, but also traded forest products with the Chinese and Indian merchants. They also developed a way to manage the monsoon rains to create reservoirs, providing fresh water for a growing population. Eventually, the population outgrew the water supply, though, and the empire would dissolve. Borobudur is a massive Buddhist monument in Java built by the Salendra uh, dynasty. The three miles of walkways tell the stories of the lives of the Buddha. Angkor Wat is one of many Khmer mo uh, monuments. It's a Hindu temple whose central tower symbolizes Mount Meru, the cosmological center of the universe in Hindu belief. Because of the strong economic, religious, and cultural influences from South Asia, many scholars once spoke of a process of Indianization of Southeast Asia, rather like uh, Sinicization of East Asia, the spread of Chinese culture. While the impact of India is undeniable, we should not overstate this process as Southeast Asian cultures blended imports from India with their own beliefs, traditions, and practices. Toward the end of the post-classical era, Islam had spread into Southeast Asia and an Islamic state was created at the Straits of Malacca. It grew prosperous for the exact same reasons that Srivijaya did earlier. Uh, Strayer goes into more detail about this in chapter 12. It's um, also a term that we've experienced when we talk about uh, Dar al-Islam. In this map you can see the kingdom of Srivijaya um, here are the Straits of Malacca. Srivijaya obviously is established around it. Here is the Khmer Empire, Angkor, where Angkor, Angkor Wat is. Uh, Borobudur, the uh, Buddhist uh, monument, is here on the island of Java. Also note, uh, Vietnam at this point is a tributary state of China. Uh, the Champa Kingdom down here, where Champa rice originates, um, which, of course, leads to dramatic uh, population increases in China. Whereas Islam penetrated into the eastern side of the Indian Ocean Basin relatively later, it spread into the western side early, creating a unique hybrid culture that would become a key feature of Indian Ocean trade. This was the civilization of the... Uh, Swahili people on the coastal uh, eastern part of Africa. While they were originally of Bantu descent, this civilization created a new identity thanks to their participation in the Indian Ocean trade networks. While the Swahili coast had traded with merchants from the north for centuries, the rise of Islam marked a dramatic turning point in the region's fortunes. Swahili merchants exported the goods and sometimes slaves of the African interior to the markets of India, Southeast Asia, and China. Conversely, they imported goods such as Indian art and Chinese porcelain. The Swahili culture was an urban culture composed of independent city-states of perhaps 20,000 people. Some of these cities included Lamu, Mombasa, Kilwa, and Sofala. Despite a common language and culture, there was no political unity. These societies had intense social stratification between elites and commoners. The Swahili, Swahili city-states were home to rich, uh, a rich fusion of various cultures from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. The Swahili language, for example, is of Bantu origin but uses Arabic script and has many Arabic loanwords. It would become the lingua franca of Indian Ocean trade. In other words, it was the official language, uh, unofficial, official language of trade uh, throughout the Indian Ocean. So traders all over would learn Swahili as the common language for trade. With the spread of Islam, the east coast of Africa was home to a large population of Muslims 
who did not trace their roots back to the Arabian Peninsula, but did see themselves as part of the larger Islamic community, Dar al-Islam. As Muslims, they, they saw fellow black Africans who did not participate uh, or did not practice Islam as outsiders. In other words, if you were not a Muslim, even if you were an African, um, they felt that you were different than they were. Thus, they felt they had more in common with Arabs and Persians than they did among the Africans, many of whom continued to practice animism. The Swahili merchant, merchants forged links with peoples of the interior of the continent as well as further south. To the south and inland from the coast lay the impressive kingdom of Great Zimbabwe, with large stone buildings in its capital, indicating much wealth and social organization. In this map you can see several of the city-states along the Swahili coast. Um, here are the, uh, the ones that are mentioned earlier. Great Zimbabwe down here and a little bit into the interior um, trades with the um, Swahili city-states, which then spreads their product. Gold was a big one that came from Great Zimbabwe uh, throughout the rest of the Indian Ocean. So, um, another uh, example besides the Indian Ocean um, was in East Africa. Uh, the trade system there gave, I'm sorry, the in West Africa, the trade system there allowed the people of West Africa to plug into a larger network. Um, the beginnings of West African trade uh, go back to the classical era, but it's important to note that there are diverse environments in and around the Sahara, each producing a different set of goods. To the north, on the shores of the Mediterranean, were communities that produced goods such as weapons, tools, books, clothes, and glassware. The Sahara itself had deposits of copper and salt, as well as uh, oases with date palms. To the immediate south, in the Sahel, or savanna grasslands, there were millet and sorghum farmers, as well as enormous deposits of gold. Further south in the forests, root and tree crops such as yam and kola nuts grew. The introduction of the camel changed the course of trade in Africa. Now massive caravans of hundreds of people and thousands of camels could bring salt and other goods from the north across the, the dangerous Sahara in exchange for gold and other goods in the south. Soon Arab merchants would bring the news of the Islamic revelations to West Africa. During the classical era, there were a number of urban centers along the Niger River that were key hubs of trade. These cities formed the basis for the Niger River civilization that we studied in the last unit. With the spread of Islam in the post-classical era, Arab travelers knew the lands south of the Sahara as the Sudan, that was the word they used, which meant land of the blacks, as opposed to the lighter-skinned Berbers who uh, were native to North Africa, which they called the Maghreb. As the network began to expand, the wealth it produced would have social and political consequences as well as economic ones. Um, several empires, such as Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, developed into wealthy states thanks to their monopoly uh, control over the Saharan trade routes and their access to plentiful gold deposits. We'll look more closely at these empires in class, Mali in particular. While men generally enjoyed positions of patriarchal power, women played important roles in court and in the workforce as agricultural laborers and the makers of craft goods such as pottery. Generally speaking, gender roles in West Africa were more egalitarian than elsewhere in Dar al-Islam. Like elsewhere in the world, there were various forms of slavery. Slaves were generally taken from stateless societies further to the south, and many slaves were exported to the Islamic slave markets in the north. It is important to note, however, that most slaves were largely domestic servants, as opposed to hard laborers that we associate with chattel, chattel slavery in later periods. In other words, they were still treated as humans, um, particularly if they had converted to Islam, they would have to be set free before they were die they died. Their children were not um, automatically born into slavery. So a lot of the things that we associate with slavery do not really apply during this time period. Nonetheless, they are still uh, captured and bought and sold as a kind of property. 
The wealth of the West African cities made them centers of trade and manufacturing, but also culture, education, and religion. Cities like Jene, Timbuktu, and Gao would become important sites that attracted merchants and scholars from throughout Dar al-Islam. Um, in this map, you can see several things. First of all, the blue, the main trade routes across the Sahara. And again, um, down below in the Sahel, first um, Ghana, the smaller uh, empire. And then uh, Mali, the larger one, and of course, towards the end, the largest is the Song A, towards the end of the post-classical period. Um, also note some of the key cities here, Jene, Timbuktu, and Gao. Um, but remember, the key thing is it's connecting this area of West Africa to the Mediterranean, and then, of course, that gets plugged into um, the other existing trade routes, thus providing a way, for example, for Ibn Battuta to uh, use those trade routes to travel essentially the world as he knew it. While the trade networks in the Eastern Empire would overlap and join to form a giant Afro-Eurasian network in the post-classical era, the situation was very different in the Americas or the Western Hemisphere. Unlike uh, Eurasia with its east-west axis, the axis, the, 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 the orientation of the geography that we've seen going back to Jared Diamond, uh, in the Americas, though, there were ser serious geographical obstacles to travel that made long-distance interregional trade impossible. Moreover, the lack of pack animals like horses, camels, and donkeys meant that all cargo had to be carried by humans. However, the Americas did have a series of regional trade networks that could move goods and uh, cultural practices over hundreds, if not thousands of miles. The most notable example in the classical era is the so-called turquoise roads, which connected Chaco Canyon, Teotihuacan, and Mayan city-states. After the fall of Teotihuacan, the Aztecs established a mighty empire in central Mexico. They developed a professional merchant class called Poteca, which uh, traded as representatives of the state. They would go off on independent trade missions representing um, the ruling elite of the Aztec societies. The Poctecas would travel great distances to trade primarily for luxury goods. In the south, the Inca used their 20,000-mile road system to run a state-controlled trade network of various commodities from the diverse lands they controlled. They had a further advantage in that they could use the llamas to help carry the loads. And in this map, you'll see several things. First of all, the red note is the spread of maize. We know it originated in central Mexico. This happens over thousands and thousands of years, and it's not uh, anything like the quick spread of um, religion, for example, in um, Eurasia. It takes a long time, uh, particularly going through uh, from Central uh, America, what we would call Mesoamerica, into South America, this is very, very dense jungle. Um, it's not a particularly easy trade route. What you can see, though, first of all, going back to the end of the uh, p classical era, early post-classical era, a trade network beginning around the uh, Mississippi that benefits, of course, Cahokia. Um, note, too, the blue arrows. These are routes that were uh, run by the Pacteca from the Aztec Empire, which is again central in central in central Mexico, and down here the uh, Inca Empire is very long, running along the coast of the Pacific, and they build a road system that allows uh, very easy transport within its particular empire. So in the reflection section, Strayer comes back to this idea of globalization, of interconnectedness. And he looks at how that term is a little bit different in the ancient period uh, as opposed to the modern period. And he uh, points out a couple of contrasts. In the ancient world, uh, because of transportation costs, relatively light luxury goods dominated the ancient economic networks. By contrast, in the industrialized modern world, humans could ship commodities for mass consumption. So that's a main difference there. The, the more ancient 
uh, trade networks focus more on luxury goods, whereas the more modern uh, trade networks focus on goods for mass consumption. Um, another difference in the ancient world, there is a relatively balanced system uh, with no dominant cent center. If you think about the classical era, this is particularly so where you have uh, Han China on one side of the trade route of the Silk Road and uh, the Roman Empire on the other. Later on, you'll have the Tang Dynasty and the Abbasid sort of in the middle and Byzantine Empire on the other. So the, the, it's sort of spread out. By contrast, in the modern era, the Western uh, European civilizations came to dominate the global system. And indeed, this is uh, changing in our lifetime, but it's still more or less the case that uh, international trade is very heavily influenced by uh, Western Europe and the United States. Um, thank you for joining me for this week's uh, video lecture. I hope you were able to get all the information you need, and I will see you in class.